Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman told a distinguished minister, Dr. Howard, who came from Australia, who preached very strongly on the subject of sin. After the service, one of the church officers came to counsel with him in his study. He said, Dr. Howard, we don't want you to talk as openly as you do about a man's guilt and corruption. Because if our boys and girls hear you discussing that subject, they will more easily become sinners. Call it a mistake if you will, but do not speak so plainly about sin. The minister took down a small bottle and, under, and on the, showing him the bottle, he said to the visitor, you see the label that's on the bottle? It says, this is strychnine. And underneath it in bold red letters, the word poison. Do you know, man, what you're asking me to do? You are suggesting that I change the label. Suppose I do and paste over it the words, essence of peppermint. Don't you see what might happen? Someone would use it not knowing the danger involved and would certainly die. So it is too with the matter of sin. The milder you make your label, the more dangerous you make your poison. My brothers and sisters, that ought to cause us and it ought to shake us in understanding. We start out in this series on sin and the gospel story because in the absence of sin, there would have been no need for the gospel. Amen? It was because of sin that entered in that we have the gospel. And so what is sin? What is sin? So let's define that as we go forward. Sin is any rebellion to the law of God in thought, act, or being. Yes, 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 my brothers and sisters, what comes into our minds and our thoughts, what our eyes see, all of those things can result in us sinning. It doesn't have to actually be an action, but just lust. And lusting after someone is, in fact, what? A sin. So we need to recognize that sin, first of all, is serious. Sin is serious. Why is it so serious, Brother Mark? I don't understand. Well, I'm glad you asked because right here in John 10 and 10, it tells us sin is a killer. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came, Jesus, that I might have life and have it abundantly. You see, my brothers and sisters, it is sin that caused us to be separated from God. We just have to go back to creation, and we'll talk about creation in a few minutes. But God created man. He created, he created uh, the heavens and the earth. He created land. He created man to live in perfect harmony with each other. And he said, man, you can have your way, but do not eat of the tree of the good and evil. And because they were disobedient to God, because they were disobedient to God, center, sin entered into the world. So my brothers and sisters, we need to understand it was never God. It was God's plan for us to always live in harmony with him. But because of sin entering in, that's why it's such a serious thing. Because it interferes with the relationship that God wants to have with each one of us today. So it is a killer. For years, I used to think about it was just the devil. And yes, absolutely, he is a thief. He is demonic and has demonic angels. But undoubtedly behind, there are also human men who stand up behind pulpits who refuse to preach the whole gospel, who will never preach on sin or who will make light of sin or be afraid that it would hurt church attendance or it might offend some people. The Bible is telling us here, as I reread re re this verse in context, I realize, yes, the devil does, but it also goes to those who are failing to teach the gospel and those who witness and do not tell people the danger of sin. You see, my brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility in Christ Jesus to tell someone how dangerous sin is. In fact, that was the, the rationale behind the opening introduction was, we don't want to change the label. The label needs to be very clear. This isn't candy. This is poison. 
In other words, people need to understand associated with sin is death. And then let me tell you how serious it is, my brothers and sisters. The word says that sin is so devastating that it has impacted all of creation. Romans 8, 20 and 21 says, For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself also would be set free, free from slavery to corruption and to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The Bible says that the earth moans and groans over the penalty of sin. You may be asking yourself the questions, what did the plants and the animals and the birds do to deserve being subject to corruption, which means death and decay? We must understand it was all because of man's sin. No part of nature exists like God intended it to as a result of sin. The idea of the word is, is expressed here of futility is being without success, of being unable to achieve a goal or purpose. You see, because of man's sin, no part of nature now exists and intended to be and originally was. God himself subjected it to the impossibility of ever getting better on its own. And that's true for man as well. You see, my brothers and sisters, when you have been injected with the disease called sin, man alone cannot help himself. Somebody ought to say amen today. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this word sin is, some people like to say missing the mark or I've fallen short. But we just need to be very upfront and say sin is sin. And we can be very certain of the fact that sin impacts all. And then here's for my brothers and sisters, this is the one that I think really burdened me more than anything as I was preparing this text. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. You see, my brothers and sisters, it says right there in Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Can I just revert back to the garden before I take you back to Israel? In the garden, in the garden, man and woman were in perfect harmony with God. But when sin entered into the world as a result of their disobedience, it broke the fellowship. In fact, it broke the fellowship in such a way that they tried to hide from God. My brothers and sisters, can I just share with you the creator of the ends of the earth and the universe? You can't hide from God. But because of their sin and because what sin does to a person, they thought they could hide themselves. And then, and then when they figured out they couldn't hide, God brought to them their sin. They tried to cover it up with fig leaves. But a fig leaf wasn't enough. The Bible says that the Lord had to provide some skins. In other words, there was some bloodshed that took place in the garden that was required because of sin. So you see, my brothers and my sisters, that sin separates us. The reason why Israel had not been saved and redeemed from Babylonian captivity was not due to the Lord's inability God's hand uh, was unable to work because of so much defiled sin existed among God's people. And my brothers and sisters, we need to understand that each sin that we have that's, not, that's unconfessed separates us from God. When we do not confess our sin, we hurt our prayer life. When we have unconfessed sin, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is grieved. So we need to understand that each and every time we sin, we have separated ourselves. We've moved away from God. I've often used this illustration about a husband and wife who they just were on their honeymoon and they were driving and the, uh, his new wife was just sitting right up under him. Oh, and they were all lovey-dovey riding. Ten years later, later, the wife is sitting on the farthest, closest to the other door. And so she said, looks over at her husband who's driving and says, 
I don't understand. When we first got married, we were so close together and so loving. What happened? Husband looked over at the wife and said, I'm in the same place I was in. <laughs> in other words, my brothers and sisters, God always had a plan for us to be in close fellowship. And he always will have that desire. But it is us through sin who move a step away further and further from unconfessed sin. And we can look back on our lives. I can look back on my life and say some of the things that I did, I look back on those things that I said it's a result of the fact that it was not God leaving me, but I had left God because I had unconfessed sin in my life. Oh, I'm not the only one in here. You just don't have to say amen. You can just say ouch. But it is that unconfessed sin that we have to deal with. Yes, my brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but it's a lot of things that I can be separated from. But I don't want to be separated from God. I don't want to be separated from his presence and the Holy Spirit working and abiding in me, giving me guidance and direction every day. I don't ever want to be separated from that. There's a lot of things that I could be separated from and I could deal with that. I could, be sep I, could be, I could deal with being separated from my truck. I could be deal with being separated from my house. I could deal with being separated from my job. But my brothers and sisters, can I just tell you what would just rattle me to my core is to be separated from God. And we need to understand how sin impacts our relationship with a great, pure, and loving God. And we should not take it lightly. Uh, that's why my brothers and sisters, a savior is needed. A savior is needed to take away that sin. John 1.29 says, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Aren't you so glad that there is a precious lamb who takes away our sin? In the Old Testament times, the people of Israel followed a system of sacrifices in order to pay the debt for their sins. God's laws determined what types of sacrifice were required in order to atone for different types of sins. Most living sacrifices were to be a perfect animal without blemish. In the New Testament, Jesus, God's son, came to earth to reunite us with God through the ultimate sacrifice, his life. He truly is the perfect lamb of God, amen? Right. And, it was, and it had to take a perfect yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. That blood had to be shed. And that's why every time we have a sin in our life, we ought not ever forget about the cross and the blood that was shed and the price that was paid. And we wouldn't take sin so lightly in our lives when we recognize what a great price was paid. You know, I get upset at my children sometimes because they don't understand. Not, 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 not y'all's children. I'm talking about my own. I'm talking about my, I'm talking about my own. My own. My own. Not yours. Mine. You know, you know, I would work as hard as I could to provide for them and do things for them. And, 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 and you know what? I would do, uh, uh, buy them something or do something for them. And they would be like, oh, dad, that's not the latest Nintendo game. You, I went to work every day. I, I don't even get to play the Nintendo, but I got the wrong game. Or, or, or when it was time to upgrade the PlayStation to the next level and I told them no, they were so ungrateful. And I kept thinking to myself, as much as I do for you, as much as I pour out in support and love for you, yeah. how is it that you could just take me for granted Amen. until I started asking myself, until I started looking at my life and saying, how does God feel about our relationship? How many times have you said, thank you, God, for the simple, thank you, God, for waking me up. Thank you, God, for clothing me in my right mind. You know, there are people who are walking on the streets. Brother Cliff, could we just give testimony? People walking the streets is mentally ill. You talk to Brother Cliff after. I'm not saying he's ill. I'm not saying that. But he had a situation this morning. He shared with me that a person that was mentally ill. 
We take for granted that we'll wake up in our right mind. And we ought to be thankful for those things. We ought to be thankful for the fact that we can breathe on our own and don't need a machine. We ought to be thankful for those things. Even if we have to live off peanut butter and jelly, we ought to be thankful that I got peanut butter and jelly. If I don't get to drive a really nice car, we ought to be thankful, God, that you give me a vehicle. And if I don't have a vehicle, God, thank you for giving me legs that I can walk. Lord, I tell you, no matter what circumstance or situation we find ourselves in, can I just share with you that we are always in better shape with God in our lives and do, we're doing without a bunch of stuff than not having God and having a bunch of stuff. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we need to be always praising and thanking God, even in the midst of storms, trials, and tribulations, because no matter what state we find ourselves in, I can tell you right now, I'm thankful, Lord, because all that you've done for me, I'm not deserving of it. I don't deserve it. Thank you. Even, even in the midst of trials and storms. Oh, yes, my brothers and sisters, we need a Savior who takes away sin. And then Jesus Christ is that sinless Savior. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was sinless, and it is because Jesus was sinless that we have hope and eternity in heaven. If Jesus was not sinless, there would be no sacrifice for sin. Adam and Eve's disobedience to God in the Garden of Eden ushered into that sin, as I talked about earlier. It took that perfect lamb. Even though they were warned, they disobeyed God. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we need to understand that we do serve a sinless Savior. And then he came to destroy the works of the devil. Colossians 2.15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphant, triumphant over them by the cross. The defeat of Satan by the Lord Jesus Christ is complete. Jesus has defeated Satan through the temptation in the desert, through his public ministry, Amen. through his death and resurrection, yeah. and then his promise that he would come back. Yes, yes, yes. He continues to defeat Satan every day through the lives of believers who Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are going out doing those things that are pleasing to God. Yes, God wants to use us to help destroy the works of the devil. Oh, Brother Mark, how can we do that? I'm glad you asked me that question because there's somebody out there on the street, some boy or girl, man or woman who does not know Jesus Christ as their savior of their life. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we can go out and tell them that there is a sinless Savior. His name is Jesus. And you know what? All you've got to do is reach out to him with a sincere heart and admit the fact that you have unconfessed sin in your life, that you're on your way to hell, and I need a Savior. Yes, my brothers and sisters, I got a, I got a big old uh, 22,000 gall gallon swimming pool. It was there when I bought the house. I wish I knew better. I wouldn't have bought the house. <laughs> that, that, that pool takes a lot. Of, anyway, I tell the kids, look, y'all are not that strong of swimmers. You got to have a life vest. You got to put on your vest because you're not a good swimmer. You know what, all of us? We need a life vest. Because none of us can deal with sin by ourselves. We have to admit that we need the Lord in our life and not till a person gets to that point. You see, we get so clouded with stuff, material things, that we lose sight of the fact that we must have a savior and his name is Jesus. And he came to destroy those works. What were those works? He wanted to separate God from man. He wanted to be worshiped. He wanted to be worshiped like God wanted to be worshiped. And this is where we have to be very careful, my brothers and sisters. We need to make sure that we are worshiping God and not stuff. Amen? Sometimes we can get to the point where we worship stuff. And what I mean by worship, where is your desire? Where is your time spent? How much time do you spend in the word? How much time do you spend devoted to God's work? How much do you invest in God? 
And then how much is invested in the rest of the stuff? I've often said, if you want to know somebody's priorities, all you got to do is look at two things, checkbook and a calendar. Well, I guess checkbook's almost going out of style now. I guess you got to look at your electronic statement. But how do you spend the most of your time? How do you use your resources? Is it to the glory of God? But my brothers and sisters, here's what we get to. And I wish I had some more time, but, but I, we, in our text, in our text, we see that there is a spiritual test that's provided. First, let's look at 1 John 1 and 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then 1 John 3, 6 says, no one who abides in him, it's in our text, sins. No one who sins has been him or knows him. This is what got me messed up. If no one abides in him sins, no one who sins is seen by him. Is this the saying that if we sin, we no longer are saved? Absolutely not. The question that we wrestle with and that we need to deal with today is, how do people who have experienced the miracle of new birth with their own sinfulness as they try to live in full assurance of their salvation. That is how we deal with the conflict between the reality of the new birth on one hand and our ongoing struggle with sin. How do you balance the danger of losing assurance of salvation and the danger of being presumptuous that you're already born again? How can we enjoy the assurance of being born again and yet not take lightly the sinfulness of our lives? That is so out of step with being born again. Well, my brothers and sisters, we get the answer to that from the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 18 through 20. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh for the, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Can I paraphrase that, my brothers and sisters? Paul had a struggle going on in his life. He had a desire to please God. He had a willingness to please God. And he had performed great works for God. But even the apostle Paul admits to the fact that he had to struggle each and day with the deal in this thing called sin. And we too, my brothers and sisters, must understand that there is a struggle. I don't know about you, but, but let me tell you, I have to admit, I struggle. Amen. Yeah. I struggle. Amen. I struggle. Yes, and let me tell you why it's so important for us to admit that we're struggling with sin. Because when you get to the point in your life when sin is okay, you need to question your walk with the Lord. Yeah, when you know you are being disobedient and rebellious to God, if that doesn't bother you, if that doesn't bring you to your knees, if that doesn't convict your heart, you ought to ask yourself this question. Do I really have a relationship with God? That's what he was talking about in the text. When the Lord is abiding with us and in us, we're going to be convicted when we're doing wrong. We're going to know we're doing wrong. And we will, on our own, choose to rebel against God. But can I just share with you, my brothers and sisters, I'm glad that when I struggle... God still died for me. The fact that we're struggling is the assurance that you have. The assurance is, I know that I love the Lord, but I have some birth defects that I'm dealing with. And God knows that. So if you're here today and not sure, you have sin that's unconfessed in your life and it doesn't bother you. If there are some things in your life as you read the word of God, it troubles you, and troubling you is good. That means God is still working on us. God is still working in our lives. And then that struggle is the assurance. That's what we want to happen in our lives, the struggle. And do you know it takes time? Yeah, amen. It takes some time. When I look back over my spiritual walk of where I began and where I am now, it took some time. And I realize that I still have some places to go. Amen. Oh, I'm running out of time, so let me get right to it. Let's think about the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus of Bethany from the dead. Four days after he had died. Four days he had died. 
But when Jesus showed up on the scene, good gracious alive. Don't you know? Isn't it great to know? It, it doesn't matter how long you have not walked with God. That doesn't matter how long. Whether you are 10, 12, 15, 20, 50, 60, 70, whenever you come in contact with, the, with God and give him your life, that's enough, isn't it? Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was in the tomb, and all Jesus had to do was say, come forth. And the Bible says, the Bible says that he got up out of that tomb. Good gracious alive. And because he got up, that gives us the assurance one day that we too will get up. Not just him, but the Lord Jesus Christ. But then watch this. The Bible says he directed them to unwrap the burial cloth. Good gracious. You know what? When we first accept Christ, we have so much sin wrapped around us. And aren't you glad that each and every day a little bit of that comes off? Every day we walk with the Lord, a little bit of that comes off. That until we are free, we are free from death, my brothers and sisters. So each day we understand it's a process. That process is called sanctification. That each day we walk, we take off some of the old stuff. Each day, the old Mark Booker takes something away and a new Mark Booker shows up. Each day I take away some of the old stuff through the power of Jesus' blood. I tell you, and I had to say it was because of Jesus' blood, because before him I knew I was troubling on my way to hell. But today I can be thankful to God and praise him because I recognize the fact that I got my name written in the Lamb's book of life. How do you know, Brother Mark? How how can you stand there so assuredly? Because he's abiding in my life, guiding me and convicting me. And I thank him that he didn't give up on me. Aren't you glad he didn't give up on you? And then it comes down to this spiritual test. It's right there in our text. How do you live your life? And do you love people? That's what it said at the text. Look at those last verses. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. You see, when I look at our world today, and I see people who just hate each other. There are people who are Christians who tell me they hate Democrats. There are Christians who tell me they hate Republicans. There are Christians who tell me they hate. My brothers and sisters, the Bible says we should love everyone, not agree with everyone, but we should love them. We should love them. And let me tell you why I think it's so important for us to love everyone. Because if you love everyone, there will be some disagreements and be some things that we will never agree upon. But here's the one thing we can agree upon, that all of us need Jesus Christ. Whether you're black, white, brown, pink, or yellow, all of us need Jesus Christ. You know, don't, don't you, can't you admit and insist, don't we need more love in our culture? When I look at what's happening to us in our culture, we need more love. And that love can only come by accepting Christ. And once we love Jesus, once we love God, we'll come to grow and love others. Now I have to admit, there are some people that's easier to love than others. But we should love them. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are so very grateful and thankful that we have a Savior, his name is Jesus, and that no matter our condition, we're never hopeless.